Michelle here. Welcome to my channel. In case you're new around here, I am an engineer who is quarantined in a wood shop, so I'm pretending to be a woodworker of late. And in case you saw last week's abominable river, river paddle, uh, decided this week we were gonna actually teach you how to make a real paddle that's genuinely useful. But for that, I need to summon an expert. So, ah, wow, that was a lot of work. Thanks for appearing. It just comes naturally. So this is my Uncle Peter. He is an expert canoe builder, as you saw in the canoe building video, which probably already came out. A little bit of time dilation going on. <laughs> yeah. So today, we're actually gonna teach you things. So if you're here for entertainment, you are woefully misguided because we are not funny and we are not entertaining. I'm very boring. He's very boring. Although, you get the perk of a British accent. If you can't tell, Peter married into my family. <laughs> I'm not British. <laughs> Nor am I Asian. We're gonna be making a paddle out of single piece of wood. I've seen a lot of other people, yeah. and especially on YouTube, make paddles sort of like a cutting board where they have a lot of strips of wood. Which are very, very pretty. If you've got a thickness planer and can get perfect joins like that, then great. I don't have a thickness planer, but if you have a single piece of wood, then what you get is the natural flex of that piece of wood. What you get from doing laminates is usually something that's stiffer. While stiffness may give you a little more efficiency, uh, less bend in the water, if you want to paddle any distance, then having something that flexes a bit is much easier on the joints. And when your joints get to my age, <laughs> you'll appreciate it. Yeah, this is the, the shape of blade that I, I like to make and like to use as well. Uh, it belongs to the otter tail family. It's got, it's great for deep water, no good for shallow water, but deep water on lakes, then you've got a big area. And the reason I prefer it to the beaver tail, beaver tails have the wider part down at the bottom. This has the widest part, biggest area, nearest the lower hand, and therefore it puts least strain on your joints again. So it makes paddling easier. So to find the length of the shaft of the paddle, what do I do? Well, you need to know how far apart your hands are in a comfortable paddling position. And one of the best rules of thumb for that, and it is a rule of thumb and everyone's gonna vary from it a little bit, is to take a broom, stick it on your head, and if your elbows are at right angles, your hands are roughly the right distance apart for being able to paddle with a nice straight lower, lower arm and yeah, middle of the hand, 35 inches. So, so the, moment, the measurements we've got have your hand somewhere round about the throat here, where the shaft widens out to form the blade. But of course, you want with a comfortable paddling stroke to get the blade immersed. And usually your hand, when going down beside you, doesn't get to water level. You don't get your hand wet all the time. So we want a little bit of shaft sticking out there. So it might be worth adding just another inch or two back into the overall length. Okay, so today I'm gonna actually be making two paddles, one for myself and one for whoever I'm paddling with. And so we just decided off camera that we're gonna make a 62 inch paddle, which will probably fit me best, and a 60 inch paddle for, that way if whoever I'm going out with is much taller and larger than me, they can take my 62 inch paddle, but otherwise the person can take the 60 inch paddle. And they're both gonna come out of the same the same board of cherry. Looking at something like that in 62. Okay, so for this part, our chalk line had actually broken, but I got crafty and just took a normal string and dipped it in a water bottle, and it worked. Hey, look at um, that. Excellent. Look at this brilliance right here. This is just downright ingenuity. Liquid chalk. Liquid chalk. It's free. Yep, it's colorless, it's odorless. It's responsible for a vast majority of drownings in the United States. Yep. <laughs> the symmetry, we're not gonna use the other half, we're gonna flip it over. So we use the same half. So very conveniently, our little ruler here is exactly an inch and an eighth, which is the width of the shaft that we're doing. So we're just gonna trace both sides of the ruler, but you could also chalk line it again or water line it again like we did with the midline. Yeah, and we're... 
All right, and with the outline shape double checked and triple checked, it was time to jigsaw out the shape. Now, if you have a bandsaw or any other way of cutting this out, I do recommend that. Um, jigsaws, no matter how nice your rip blade is, do not like ripping this much hardwood. So it did take a while, but eventually I got there. To round over the shaft, you're gonna to wanna to use a round over bit on a router. And I had access to a table router here, but if you don't have one and you only have a palm router, it's totally doable. It just may take a little bit more time with a hand planer and a sander later, but don't let that hold you back. Next, I marked a center line all the way around the edge of the blade to give myself a guide to plane to. It's also worth noting that a draw knife is the more traditional tool for shaping and creating paddle blades, but I prefer power tools. When power planing, you'll notice that I start at the edges and then work my way towards the center. And that's because I, even though yes, I want the paddle to be flexible, I also need to make sure that it has sort of a thicker wooden spine in the center for structure. So the cross section of the paddle, you know, closer to the shaft, is actually going to be a little bit more diamond shaped. It's going to be thicker in the center and then taper out evenly towards the edges. Another thing you need to be constantly checking for as you're doing the planning of the blade is that the balance point of the paddle should be right around where your lower hand grips the shaft. So as you're taking wood off, be constantly checking and making sure that that's still, or you're getting closer to that balance point. I did the same edge tapering on the triangle at the top of the paddle, basically just trying to reduce weight while maintaining structural integrity and balance. And then just thin it out however much you feel comfortable. And remember, don't overdo it because you can't really put wood back on once you've taken it off. And remember that you still can hand plane it and then you're gonna do a lot of sanding. So more will come off. So be a little bit conservative, but definitely you want to take the bulk of the wood off with the power planer. Once the rough shape of the paddle blade is there, it's time to break out the hand plane, and this is where a lot of the detail work comes into play. I decided that the shaft was a little bit too wide for my grip, and so I wanted to thin it out, and I did that with a hand plane just because it's the easiest way to get like a really smooth, even finish. Um, so I just really like thinned it out, particularly around the spots where my hands would grab. The other areas was mostly just aesthetic. But this is also your chance to take out the ridges from the router, etc., and also do some final balance checks of the entire paddle. All right, so with the blades and the shafts pretty much there on the two paddles, it's time to work on the grips. So what I did is I ran a line on the table saw at the deepest point that I want the curve to be in, and that will give me a line to chisel to. So let's chisel. And once I'd chiseled out the majority of the wood, I just attacked it with a flap disc sander. Just went at it. So for this paddle, which is my guest paddle, I decided to go with a symmetrical grip design, which means that there's pretty much an equal divot on each side of the paddle. And that's sort of the more common, comfortable paddle grip. But then for my own paddle, I decided to do an asymmetrical design. And that's this one. And you can see that the, the slit that I cut on the table saw is much deeper and it's only gonna be on that one side. So my wrist will be a little bit straighter as I paddle, which is something that I've always wanted in a paddle. And since it might not be super clear just from looking at this shape, this divot here is what my fingers will curl into and then my palm will sit on a flattened section on the other side. And then this divot here is mostly for aesthetics. It's just to give it that sexy S shape because there's like no point in having a flat surface on a very curvy paddle. And then I used a Dremel to do some of the sanding and shaping in those tight interior curves, but like my uncle does this by hand with sandpaper, so really, it's up to you. If you don't have a Dremel, that absolutely shouldn't stab you. And then once the grip is a comfortable shape and you like it, you like holding it, it's just time to sand. So 
Uh, I started with like 80 or 120, and then for this, I actually worked my way all the way up to 800. But once I got past 220, I switched to just hand sanding without the orbital. Going up to 800 is only necessary for the grip and the shaft though, because those are gonna get oiled. The blade is gonna get varnished, so that can stop at 220. I forgot to get it on camera, but you can see I put a masking tape ring around the shaft right where it meets the blade, and that's where it's gonna switch from varnish to oil. So I'm only varnishing up until the masking tape. And I'm varnishing it using Gleam by Total Boat that I thinned down a little bit. It's typically good practice to thin varnish before going straight onto bare wood, and then you can use straight varnish after that. And then after about six coats of varnish, I could go in and remove that masking tape, revealing a really nice clean line. And for oil, I'm going in with a Danish oil, and that really does a good job of protecting the wood. And I also found it matches the color of Gleam really nicely, so you don't kind of get that aggressive line between the oil and the varnish. But the oil will be so much more comfortable when you're paddling for a long time, you'll be less likely to get blistered, and it's just a way nicer paddling experience. So I went in with a couple coats of oil every few hours, just out of their coat, and that just protects the wood. And then it's just time to hit the river. Now, if you find yourself doing a lot of river paddling, um, feel free to fiberglass the tip, but I didn't think that was super necessary. Um, and the video you just watched was filmed in May, and it is now end of August. It took me that long to pull my crap together and edit it. But um, I put hundreds of miles on this paddle, and it's so comfortable. This is definitely my favorite style of paddle. Yes, it's what I've been paddling my whole life, but um, I do find it to be really comfortable and really easy to control, especially for long trips. So it may not be the flashiest paddle in the world, but it's my favorite. Anyway, if you make a paddle, please feel free to tag me in social media. I would love to see what you guys make um, at Xylofoxlin. And also thank you to my patrons who help make all of these videos possible. Their names like here or something. Anyway. I don't have a great ending for this. I just wanted an excuse to go out on the river, so I was like, let's film an outro on the river. So here we are. Bye. <laughs>